good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. I understand that Lucia is call, uh, calling from uh, Brazil. And well, I'm calling from the uh, Netherlands here. So, well, nice meeting all of you. Nice meeting you in this book club. My name is Mikhail, and I will be the facilitator for this book club. And honestly, this is my first time leading such a book club. So I would be happy to receive any uh, feedback so that we can have a great time uh, in this book club. So this is the second cohort for the art packages. And today we are going to read through the first two chapters, the introduction, which is very short and the whole game of uh, building our packages. So even though I'm presenting this, but this is 99% um, shamelessly taken from John's presentation from the first cohort. But I think his content is uh, quite good with a lot of, uh, I would say a lot of great recommendations, especially regarding the um, order in which we should read through this um, R Packages book. So this week, there are several uh, learning objectives that we want to achieve. First of all, is to identify reasons that you might write a package. So I'm pretty sure that our, our mileage in uh, using R uh, varies here from uh, people to people. And then we may have um, different reasons um, to write a package. And well, um, we'll share about um, the motivation why we joined this book club and why we also want to learn more about this package after this brief presentation and the life coding. And we also want to recall the philosophy that motivates dev tools and similar meta packages that really streamlines and um, automates our package development. And we're going to uh, discuss the ordering of the um, chapter reading because, uh, well, in the book, of course, the order is from one to 20, but then they suggested a, I would say, a widely, uh, wildly different orders. But I think it will, it makes so much sense. And we'll see um, why it makes so much sense with their way of ordering. And also the whole um, content of the second chapter is to recognize the package development process. And I also want to add something here is so that we can recognize that to learn, that to make our package, that there is no a big requirement or big prerequisites in terms of your expertise in using R. As long as you can make a function in R, as simple, um, even a very simple function, then you're actually, you already have what is needed to make an R package. So in the uh, first chapter, that is a quote by Hilary Parker on why we should write a package. And the reason why we, um, we should write a package it doesn't have to be about sharing our code um, to the world to advertise ourselves to promote our um, to promote our career, but it's more about saving ourselves time so that uh, we can document our work and also it would be so that we can be kind to our future self so that our future self wouldn't have to really. Um, plow through our directories or our untitled.r scripts to find where our um, functions were defined. Of course, it's nice so that we can, we can share the code with others, but I think um, writing a package for ourselves is, um, is a good reason to start with. And also in our package that there is already a um, a predefined way to organize. For example, all your scripts are put in the R folder and your tests in the test folder and so on. So everything's already organized um, in a similar manner. So as if you make more and more packages, then of course, everything will be a like a second nature to you. 
And there's also several standardized tools that will help you, that will help us in writing a package like use this dev tools. And I just heard about this good practice package. I haven't really used it, but John um, recommended in the first cohort. So I guess um, we'll see how it will add values to the existing package development. So um, so there are several um, R packages that helps in um, writing a package. So DevTools is like a meta package um, that encompasses um, various uh, package for um, package development. I don't know how many times I have to say the word package for now, but I guess I will say it <laughs> so many times. And also use this. So use this, I would say it's um, it's like a Swiss knife for, uh, it's like a, yeah. For a package development, there are so many um, useful things there. I, if you haven't used it, I would really recommend um, looking through the uh, function list um, the function for working with Git, I find it really, really useful and streamlines things. For example, if you use, um, like you use GitHub and then you can actually, it can actually do a forking and cloning in one step, which I find really, really uh, handy. And there is this uh, good practice package, which I uh, don't find super helpful, but uh, honestly, I don't have that much uh, experience in developing package. So I haven't really tried all the fancy packages out there. And well, if you have um, used R for um, so long, you know that if uh, that there are um, so many people write packages in R for even a super niche things, but that makes R really interesting. And also for this package called Styler, where it can enforce um, a style in the uh, code writing. So I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, about the styler. Yes. So it is something, um, um, I, I think it's a package, right? That allows you to style your code, right? Yes. So what brings styler to the, um, here to uh, pa uh, uh, packages talk? I think it's more about, um standardizing how you write your code because everyone yeah. if everyone writes the code in the same um in the same way then i would say for others who would read it people can understand your code much easier and also for your own sake because if you use the same um style for example i think um you can put um a space before the equal sign when you're before and after equal sign when you're um, inserting an argument in your function or also how many uh, tabs um, you use to indent like um, either four or two, then um, you can just, yeah, I think, well, in the live coding, I can show you a little bit how Styler can help. So it's basically, you just have to highlight your code and, um, well, there is a shortcut in Art Studio. Uh, I think Control Shift A, and then it can automatically uh, style your code according to the um, yeah. style that you have defined. Yeah. So I, I find it nice. I have used Styler. Uh, my question is: um, when you write package, must you style it using Styler, or must you style it um, to be standard way? Um, is this recommendation, or is this something necessary? Mm, well, I think this would save you time, whether it's really compulsory or not. I don't think so, but it's just it saves it saves time, and you don't have to think a lot about it. You just have to highlight and run the function, and you're okay. done. Okay. Yeah, especially Styler can be part of a continuous integration, continuous development workflow where the when other developer uh, mi uh, miss some of your style, it could automatically co correct the style, your, your package style, things like that. 
Yeah, so so in my opinion, it's it's best to be consistent yourself anyway. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's always useful to have something like Styler, and also if it's necessary or not. Like for example, if you want to add your package to Biconductor, so one of the big uh, repositories for our packages, they really, 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 really want you to use their uh, their style, so their coding practices. So you, you don't have to do it, but they really, 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 really recommend it. And for Cran, uh, it doesn't matter at all. All right. Thank you very much, yeah. all. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, Styler by default use the Tidyverse um, um, coding standard, and if I'm not mistaken, the Tidyverse way of coding and Bioconductor's way of coding is vastly different. So, I think um, no matter which style that you end up using, just be consistent with what you have, and if you haven't had those set of rules embedded in your mind, I would say Styler is the first way to go. But then of course, if you can um, remember the standard, if, uh, even without this function, of course, that would be even better. So, all right, I'll proceed. So um, this is, so there is this thing called machete, machete order. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. So it's actually um, a non-canonical way to um, to watch the prequel and sequels of Star Wars. So instead of watching from um, chrono- watching the Star Wars chronologically from uh, four, five, six to one, two, three, if you ha- really have to watch the prequels, um, you actually can uh, watch from the four and five. And then afterwards, you go uh, to episode two to uh, understand a bit about who um, Vader is. So if there's anyone who hasn't watched Star Wars, sorry, this is a big spoiler. And and yeah, so this is like proposing a unique way or a different perspective in um, watching through the Star Wars um, cinematic universe. And there is um, Tan from... Um, in the first cohort, he recommended this unique way of um, reading through these art packages uh, book chapters, which looks really, really uh, messy at first. But then if we actually read through the um, title and the content of the packages, I find it really sensible. So um, in total, there will be one, two, three, four, five. Nine. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm bad at uh, counting. One, two, three, four. Yeah, there is this. Uh, well, of course, we wouldn't have one uh, chapter per week, so we have uh, one or two or even uh, three chapters per week sometimes. But these uh, chapters that were that are combined in for one um, book club session makes so much sense. So, for example, um, let me. Let me, yes, so I hope you're seeing the um, our package book now. So um, we'll, so um, in, the th- in the third session, we're going to read chapter five and 18. So if we see what's chapter five is, so it's about the fundamental package of workflows and Git and GitHub. And if we read it, from uh, one to two in this kind of order, we would only know about Git and GitHub um, very late, which I think is a bit weird because you, when you're uh, writing a package or any R code, I would say, um, setting up the Git repo story should be the first thing that you do. And I think by going through this order, if, uh, for people who hasn't really um, used Git and GitHub, this will be uh, much more um, friendly f- for them because it doesn't assume um, a previous uh, background knowledge on Git and GitHub. So, and then that, for example, there's also combining um, chapter 12 and 19, which is about testing and then also automated uh, checking which I think um, really follows logically. So, so it may seem a bit haphazard 
um, if you're looking only at the numbers, but if you're looking at the um, contents and the um, the idea within those chapters, this really, this is quite a an order, I would say. And yeah, so we'll go through this uh, second chapter. All right, so I hope you're seeing my art studio screen now. Okay. All right, so I'm just opening an art session now and um, I'm just uh, going to follow the predefined um, toy package in chapter two, which is uh, making the full factors package, which has this one function called fbind to combine um, to combine two factors. All right. So if we want to uh, create a package, there is two uh, packages that I find that uh, uh, that would be highly recommended to be loaded every in every R session, which is um, the use this package and also dev tools. So let's load the package. So um, first of all, is the font size big enough for you? Or should I enlarge it? Okay, good. Um, all right. For me is the background, the color. Maybe I'm somehow the color is not fit for me. I mean. Ah, uh, should I yeah, okay. make it dark? Yeah. Or? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I guess. All right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes dark theme has quite low contrast and it's a bit hard to read. But yeah, all right, I'll just enlarge it even further. So I hope um, it's readable for everyone. Okay. All right. So, well, now I'm in this um, docs folder and I want to create a package. So we can just use this create package function followed by um, the a path to the package. And we can just type the name of the package that we want to make. And we will see, and RStudio will automatically open a new R session. And see here on the um, top right side, the it's immediately this, um, use this create package function will automatically create the backbone for um, for every R packages. All right. And in this book, so this is something that I disagree a bit, which is to run, oh yeah, because we are running a new session, we should uh, run uh, load the library again. Yeah, so this is what I disagree a bit on on you doing the use kit. So yeah, so what uh, use this use kit is doing is to initialize this folder to uh, to be a Git repo. But then, of course, right now we're making um, local Git repo, and here we can just. Um, affirm all the questions. Okay, now another restart. Yeah, you. All right. Um, well, uh, running um, the use kit now, I, I would say, um, well, I think it boils down to personal preference. I'm not entirely sure on how often you use Git, but for me, I don't use Git that often and I find if you um, if you make your local git repo and then afterwards link it to your github or your uh, gitlab repo remotely I find it to be uh, more complex it's involve a lot more in your part compared to if you start a github repo and then afterwards you clone it locally and you work from there 
I find it to be um, much easier and much more friendlier, but I'm not sure, I guess it depends on people's mileage. Yeah. I think if you try to um, use GitHub, because I started a package this morning and I just was amazed how great that uh, from use this, use GitHub, just created um, a repo just automatically and set it oh. up nicely. So you may want to try that function. I yeah, struggle actually, with that too. Awesome. Yeah, you use so you this can... header uh, Rouge event on the use GitHub functions. They change the, the packs that they use in the back you know, inside the function. So it's it much more streamlined the way to, to add the GitHub repo to and the pre existing Git. All right. So then shouldn't we um, like do use GitHub and then afterwards um, create package afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but it's not the, the, the point right now, but yeah, that's true. But yeah, anyway, that's, um, <laughs> yeah. that's true. Yeah, I think it's different workflow. Um, uh, in the book for GitHub for our users, I think uh, the author made mention of this different kind of workflow, so it fits fit to someone's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I think um, starting a remote repository um, every time, it may be not really nice because um, maybe you're making a, like a draft a project that you don't really think you were going to uh, push remotely. And yeah, so I guess it really depends on what you want to do. But anyway, so um, yeah, so let's uh, write this write our first function and well, I can just, so if you want to write a function, of course we can go to the um, R folder and then I'll write um, a new R script here, but there is a way to streamline everything. And so from use this, we can, oh, I think I, I haven't load the package again. So we can use the use underscore r function to automatically create a new R script. And we can just name it fbind without any dot r. And what it will do is automatically go to the r folder and create the a new R script called fbind, like what we have a uh, type here. And we can um, click here and then uh, go into the function and we can define a function, the function there and save. So it's super handy. And now that we have um, defined one function, uh, one um, R script that contains one function, if we want to use the function, we can just do, um, we can just type a load underscore all. So it's what it's doing is basically kind of like source, um, sourcing your R script, but then you don't have to define which um, R script that you, um, you want to source because here you're working in the predefined uh, package environment. So it knows um, already which R script that you, that has to be sourced. And he, now we have loaded the uh, function and because it's um, a package, then you see that there is no full factors um, function in your global environment, but it's there. So if we define, um, if we define this um, A and B, so we have these two examples. And we can run our function. So um, it's just concatenating two factors and it's there. So it's not in the global environment. We can also, we can, I think there is a function, ah, yep. So if we do this, then it's going to check whether 
um, F bind is stored in the global environment or not. And well, of course, it's already there's a spoiler already there, which is false. Okay, and in the book, it is also said that if this load all function, if you are using R Studio, can can be also seen in the build tab. But I, oh yeah, oh all right, it's here. Okay, sorry, I'm rambling because previously when I tried this, I cannot find this, and now it's there. So, all right. So and anyway, so uh, well, what's nice if you're using R Studio is that if you forget um, the shortcut or the name of the function, you can go to uh, various tabs and panes. Well, there are so many, too many tabs in R Studio. Sometimes I I don't think I know every um, utility functions that R Studio provides. But yeah, there are a lot of um, things that will uh, make your life easier. All right, and well, so now we have defined our function and we have a load our function. So. And we have also um, checked that our function produces the output that um, we expect. And what we can do next is to run the check uh, function. And what it will do is to ensure that um, the package contains no error. So package can be built um, until it's done. And we see that the, we have a warning here. And the warning contains, um, I find it really nice that the warnings really, um, um, really straightforward. And I mean, it's not the kind of uh, warning or errors um, that left you uh, even more confused. So it's, um, really uh, descriptive. So what the warning contains it is that you should check your description file and you should uh, define your what's the license that you want to use for this package. So we can go to the uh, folder and see that there is this uh, description file. We can just uh, click it. And here we see that um, indeed that um, the license still has to be defined. And also, um, well, the authors hasn't been defined. And of course we can um, make uh, the, um, the descriptions of the package are more, exp more, exp more straightforward. And yeah, we can just um, uh, Package for factors. I'm just um, writing everything that I can think of. And yes. and then afterwards, when we want to edit the license, we can also use this utility functions which is using the MIT uh, license. And I'm not entirely sure what, um, like the options for the license that are available out there and which um, which license we should use for uh, which purpose. So, so I guess for the time being, I'll just follow uh, what they are doing. So as you can see here, so previously, in the uh, license field, there was uh, an instruction to run the use MIT license or use the GPL license. And we have run the use MIT license and it automatically, automatically replaced the recommendation into the MIT.file license. And there is also two additional files, the license and the license.md. So license contains um, who actually the year and the copyright holder and license.md, if I'm not mistaken, the details of the license that you actually chose. Yes. And well, 
um, just like terms and conditions, I don't really read the description of the licenses, bec maybe because it's not really relevant for me, but I'm sure it's pretty important to know which license that we should use for which purpose. All right, and now we have um, uh, we have clean, we have um, make the description more informative, and we have um, specified which license we want to use. And the next thing that we can do is to make a documentation. All right, and to and by documentation, it's to simply make an, an explanation of for a function, and we can we can think of the documentation as so what's the input for this function and what it will and what it will do, and what kind of output it will returns. And to make um, so in Python, it's um, Python equivalent would be the doc string. So to make the documentation for um, our function, there, there is the a dedicated package called um, Roxygen. And there is a template um, for that. So, and if you're using our studio, you just have to go to the code. And first um, you have to um, go to, the, you just have to put your cursor within the uh, function definition, you can go to the um, first line, for example, and then you go to code, and then you can use insert or oxygen skeleton. So there is the shortcut here, control alt shift R. Okay. And it will automatically generate a template that you can e easily substitute with um, the definitions. So, this is to bind two factors. And what it do, it's create um, a new factor from two uh, factors, blah, blah, blah. And so these two are the input arguments. So as you can see here, the A and B. And oops. And it will return a factor. And we can also put an additional example. All right, so now we have um, a now we have made um, a documentation for this. But that's um, not all. You have to run the document function. So the docu what the document function do is it will check for all your functions, whether they already have this um, oxygen field or not. And what it will do. So we first run the, hmm. Mm -mm. Not sure what's happening. Let me restart my R. Hmm. Title. It's something wrong. It in says here. that you're you're in the, it's in the first line, but at least the. The title yeah. is okay. Uh, you, you are sure if the example is correct? What's uh, the... Hmm. Let me... Well, I'm not sure what's happening, but yeah. Hmm. So it's not because of the examples then. Hmm. All right. Uh, I think this is the perks of live coding. Sometimes things that can go wrong just goes wrong. 
Is it any different if you try the document in the build tab? Under more, uh, there's a, see if that works any different. Hmm. The same error? Same thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird because it's complaining about the markdown. Um, but you, you are not using any markdown format. In, in, in. On, no. on the document, on the description, it's it's saying to use R Markdown, because if it's saying to use the R Markdown, you have to have some packages or options available. I think. Yeah. Let me just I don't know just delete. Yeah. <laughs> so I can delete and see whether there's a change there. Yeah, oh. It's the same. The title, yeah, Not sure. It's weird. Let me check. Let me just um, Alt Shift R. Hmm. Oh, things are getting weird. On the when they use this package, or oh, you, you see that Hoxygen, the the second last line, it's saying to use Markdown on the Hoxygen. On your description file, the, the second uh -huh. bottom up line ah, okay. says that you use the, the Markdown. Um, it, at least I know that on the use this package, there is a use Hoxygen MD, MD uh -huh. function. Maybe if you run this, it prepares something. Hmm. So let me uh, if you see. mark down installed or not. Yeah, you, you um, have um uh, Pandoc or Markdown something. Installed. I'm pretty sure. Um try to use the uh, Yes, uh, I have it. Yeah. Um try well. to use the use oxygen uh, uh, the function use on the line oxygen on the line in, in the from the use this package if it's, oh, it's so use it's, this. Yeah, use, use. on the line uh, 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 in MD here. I, I know that at least is that function that adds this line about the, the least markdown equals true. Mm -hmm. If it don't work, remove that line from the description. Try, try to document now. Okay. Okay, so yeah. remove that, that right? line from your description. Yeah, try to document now. Oh, it, it complained, works. but it created, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. Uh, you, yeah, you well, it, it only complains that I don't... Installation. All right, okay. Hmm. This is weird because I went through all this um, before, but well, okay. I'll check whether there's um, something weird. Yeah, so now it only complains that I haven't um, really... Uh, write the functions uh, descriptions and guess let me see if I run hmm, example request a value request name and description or well, function to combine you have to give more description to the parameter yeah factor factor and, and also the example it's saying that the example is empty yeah and for the examples, okay, now everything's there. All right. No notes are right here. Yeah. So uh, what it does, what the document does, is that it will um, insert the documentation into the man folder, and we can see here the fbind.rd which is written in uh, LaTeX, but of course we don't have to write it on our own. So it autom automate um, the generation of this documentation. All right. And now we have uh, written a function, check whether it's working or not, and also um, write the documentation for our function. And what we can uh, do now is to check whether our 
uh, package will be built. All right, so now we have zero errors, zero warnings, and zero notes. And we can, because, so it indicates that we can build and install the package. So now let's install our package with this function install. All right. And now that we have, um, built the package and installed it. We should just restart our R session. And now let's load our package. Oops, foo factors. And we can have our examples. So, and we can see so we have to find a function fbind before, and now we will run the example and it works. So uh, making a package, um, it you doesn't have to uh, make another a ggplot or dplyr equivalent out there, but you can always um, make a package for, even for a really uh, basic functions. Um, but even though it's basic, maybe it's something that you use all the time. All right. And I think next is something that um, on, yeah, um, next in the um, section is, is that it's really recommended for us to write tests for our functions. And I think this is something that I don't really uh, do. Of course, I sh really should do this, but writing tests, I think is something that I um, I haven't done a lot. So it's nice to see that there is a clear example and also um, uh, sections dedicated for this. And if we want to write um, unit tests for our functions using test that we can just um, declare the uh, we can just type the function use test that and it will hmm. oh yeah we started our session okay and what it does is that it creates a folder called test and also all the uh, many utility scripts for if you want to use test that for your package. And we can use test for each function. And here we can uh, run this and then insert the name of the script that you want to um, write test for. Just use test fbind. And well, of course, it's not us and it, yeah, we should um, change this. So it's really not close to multiplications. And what it does is, is that, so if we are, so there are a lot of um, arguments for um, testing, but here we want to make sure. So if we run this function f by x um, and y, so we would expect the output of this should be identical to this factor um, z. And as you can see here, x contains a and b, and y contains c and d. And if your function works as you would expect, then of course the f by an x and y should output a, b, c, and d. And here you write, um, you just compare the output of your function with the predefined um, output that you um, set here so that if there's anything happen, maybe you um, unconsciously uh, type something in this um, fbind uh, function that 
change its behavior, then it will automatically uh, detect that when it's building the package. All right. Mm -hmm. And after this, we can, after we define the function, uh, after we define the test, then we can run test. All right, and here it gave the output pass two because we have we put um, two tests here, and our f bind function passes both um, tests. So that's it. So what you have to do is just use um, test that to have this um, test folder and everything, and then run use test to define the test for your function. And then afterwards, um, run tests to actually run the unit tests. Okay. So, and okay, and then afterwards, um, maybe when we are writing a package, we, in addition to our own custom function. Maybe we also want to borrow other functions that are already written in other package, but it's used so often. But then maybe we only want to use this one particular function and it will it wouldn't really make sense to load everything. So um, so if you want, so in the example, um, we want to use um, uh, the fct underscore count function from four cats. And if you want to put a function from another package, we can run use package and type the name of the package that you want to use. And what it will do is yep it will automatically add f uh, the package into the imports field. So it's adding a um, list of dependencies of, um, of your package. All right, and, and then we can make this uh, new um, function that borrows the utility from the FCT count uh, function. But then we here rename it um, f count. So again, um, just do use R, and then it will automatically create a new R script in the R folder. And okay. And now what we have is just. Uh, so we want to define this fcon function and it borrows the fct count function from the four cats and because we have we are going to use this uh, four cats function then we should uh, define the four cats in the imports list so that whenever we load or install this uh, package it will also check for um, whether this four cats package exists or not all right and now let's load everything. So because we have now defined a new function, we just have to load all. And then afterwards we can try the function. So we're checking um, the number of um, species in Iris data. And now we have it. And now we're sure that we have, so we have two functions now, fbind and fcount. fbind is the, our own custom function and fcount is the um, other functions. All right. And there's already the explanation there. You can just try document. Now everything's good. And we check in man. So there's another, um, R documentation of file there. 
And okay, in light of time, let's just go to the check to make sure that the package can be built. Not sure why it takes so long. All right, so no errors, no warnings, everything's green. And after we checked it, we can install. Hmm. Not sure why it's asking for this now. Mm. But yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> I guess in light of time, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Well, let's just pretend that everything <laughs> uh, works okay. I think there's something wrong with my um, our libraries here. All right. It's, it's just a recommendation. It's not obligatory. <laughs> it's not mandatory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's it um, on building our packages, on uh, writing and installing our packages. So um, okay. So yeah. So now we have um, done the uh, first session. And there will be a few sessions uh, more, I think, yeah, 10 in total. Um, so there will be um, an, a nine, a nine sessions left and each session can be, can contain uh, two, three, or even only one chapter. So I will uh, share this, um, this link. I think it would be great if um, you can uh, put your name here. So if you if you want to present a certain um, a certain uh, chapter for certain dates, then you can uh, put your name to present. And yeah, I guess if you don't mind, maybe we can go slightly over time a bit because we haven't um, introduced ourselves to each other. And yeah, so, well, thank you for uh, listening and also to, uh, and also for helping me debugging what's actually uh, going wrong when I'm doing the live coding. It really helps. And thanks for being patient. So yeah, I guess um, I can start um, introducing myself. Oh, and I can stop sharing my screen, I suppose. All right. So yeah, that's the end of our uh, first session on live coding. So um, yes, a bit about myself. I'm uh, Mikhail. I'm originally from Indonesia, but currently doing my uh, PhD in, Nedel in the Netherlands. So I have been using R for um, two and a half years now. And I use a lot, uh, well, um, quite some uh, functions uh, and packages, mostly from uh, Bioconductor because I'm doing um, statistics and bioinformatics work. Uh, but then even though I have made a lot, quite a lot of custom functions, but I haven't really taken the time to really organize everything into um, a package. What I have is mostly .r script scattered everywhere in my work directories. And then I saw that there is this plan to make an R package book club. Well, why not? I guess I can start um, a blank slate and uh, start a new habit <laughs> from, yeah, from here and on. Okay, so um, 
I guess well, I can just uh, name people and then you can uh, share what you want to expect from this uh, book club. Maybe we can start from Lucio. Okay, hello. Yeah, my, my name is Lucio. Um, I'm currently in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. Um, I'm, I'm also a PhD student in bioinformatics. Uh, I've been using R for um, something around three or four years. And um, I, I mostly started programming during my master degree, but I, I started a position where I, I, I was doing programming all day, all night, and I, I got interested in the software engineering part of R because it's actually not common that most of the R users come from a statistics or scientific background and they don't really care about the, the, the engineering part of R. So I, I'm currently really interested, in, especially in the package development world. And um, like, for, for example, Shine, Shine apps package and as package <laughs> on the, and this, this kind of work and in automation. Uh, automation of the package development process because uh, I really want to get a career on that path, especially on the bioinformatics field. I, I think there is a lot of interest in this area right now. And usually the scientific packages, the quality is really low and the maintenance burden is really high. Uh, packages developed for scientific use have a lot of um, de uh, te technical depth, depth to to follow so uh, i really want to get some impact in this area <laughs> that's mostly it <laughs> yeah i really agree i mean um there are so many statistics packages especially in cran that is so poorly documented they they don't yeah. even have vignette and i find uh being able to actually uh, run those uh packages is like a satisfaction on its own even though it's actually very bad yes <laughs> And I also expect that this book club could be a good opportunity to, to enhance that for everyone. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Lucio. And yeah, um, Ken, would you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I'm a software developer. Been using R for quite a few years. Um, I work for a company that makes uh, imaging equipment for microscope slides. So it's kind of a different aspect of bioinformatics. And I've written a couple of our packages that basically do analysis and visualization of the data that comes out of our instrument. Um, so I'm not new to package development, but I'm hoping to get a deeper understanding of some of the details and maybe learn some tips. Um, that's it. All right, thank you, Ken. And Kevin, would you? Hey, um, I'm in Florida. I'm in. Um, right between Tampa and Orlando, if you can visualize that. Um, uh, I use, I've been using R for a while, but I've kept getting better. I evaluate social programs um, in Florida and I just use it to automate. I don't, um, I use packages in my own functions because I'm evaluating the same uh, social program. And so it's the same program, same just different data, the same structure. So I have been grad and I build shiny apps out of it. Um, so I'm doing a package and a, a shiny app out of it. Um, but I get a little bit frustrated because I, the one area of the package that I don't have a hard time with is when I get the, all the notes about the global environment <laughs> for my functions. And uh, I've seen, I just want to get that wrapped up. <laughs> and then maybe keep getting better at uh, and maybe develop a package I can share one day. But I usually just keep it in-house <laughs> for my analysis project. All right, thanks, Kevin. And maybe next, Aisham Chudin. Hello, um, my name is Shamsuddin. I'm from Nigeria, um, but I'm calling from Portugal, Porto here. Um, I'm currently a PhD student um, doing natural language processing. And I'm involved in R lately, where my supervisor is um, R Vias, and he's interested in R. And uh, I'm always working on Python. And uh, um, everything I do, he said, 
do it in R. And uh, so he forced me to learn R. So I'm using Python. So for quite a year and so um, I started learning R and I found out that, that R is really awesome. And you can do a lot of things um, easily um, without, uh, I mean, programming everything like Python. I mean, yeah. So I'm currently um, enjoying R and going deep um, to the R. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you uh, for this club, Michael. And we have been together with Michael in another club um, for pay. Yeah, for deep learning for Python. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we met somewhere else. And uh, incidentally, um, yeah, uh, I met uh, I met Michael. So, uh, Michael, thank you for this. Um, yeah, it's really um, awesome to be here to learn more about R. Thank you. To me, it's a bit weird to see someone moving from Python to R and especially make a positive comment about R. But yeah, <laughs> so welcome to the book club. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, uh, Kuhn, which introduce yourself. Yeah, if you're going from, from, from Python to R, you're going the wrong way, to be honest. But, you know, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So yeah. my, name is, <laughs> my, my name is Kuhn. Uh, I'm actually a colleague of uh, Miguel. And as I work uh, on, uh, on the, I, I'm like the data science uh, statistician guy on our department and uh, starting also to become a bit of a immunologist. I uh, have some experience in R. I think I've used R for like, I don't know, 10 years or something now. Uh, and yeah, just getting better at it. And uh, I also created a package already for, for bioconductor. It's really, uh, really simple to be honest. Uh, but I actually wanted to join this club because Miguel asked me and uh, I, I really want to know a bit more about the, the, the finer works of uh, uh, the, the package building. Because when I started doing this, I was like, yeah, just, just like chapter two, right? It seems pretty easy, actually, <laughs> you just do it like this. But then when you really go into the, 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 the more tough documentation stuff and the, the, inner, uh, the inner code and, and, and some things are really challenging. So I thought it would be nice to, uh, to join the book club and read uh, this book, actually. And one comment, actually, if you're going to watch Star Wars in that uh, order, it's horrible. Don't do that, please. <laughs> I agree. No. <laughs> but for the book club, it's fine, I think. I think it's a nice order. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more practical, the, the order that John, John, John proposed for the this book club is more practical than the order that the books presented. Also. But uh, w one thing that we have to have in mind is that this book, this book is it's being constantly enhanced and changed. So, if if someone don't don't agree specifically with the with the order, we, we can arrange something or do something around it. Yeah, I think the recommended order uh, kind of tries to emulate um, what you're actually never... doing in in the uh, when you're making a package. So. I think it's also a nicer, this um, suggested order. Yeah, sure. And um, you know, I think uh, everyone here is in the Slack channel. Yes, oh, well, I, yeah. I do. I just joined. Um, At okay, least I, I, I was in the Slack channel before in, in the first cohort. And it was nice to see that most of the people that were in the first cohort, they, they really used it to to give chips or even if you have a late night doubt with some functions we we we, sh we have to we should use the the select channel for this kind of thing it's good <laughs> yeah and i saw that um so many people even after the uh, first cohort ended they're still uh, posting and asking for suggestions which i find really nice yeah yeah so I think that's what makes um, our um, very uh, interesting for me, which is the community. I mean, I've tried to look for one in Python, but was, to me, it's the atmosphere is really different. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm biased. Yeah, most of the people that have a bad feeling about R is the people that learned R before the Tideverse and all that. Because actually, after 2017, I went through a really revolution, especially in the tools. Tools like use this dev tools, tools that is the test that they are maturing right now. Now is the time that those tools are 
go into production. And now is the time that we are going to see the, a really revolution around R and a more production level code around it. Yeah, I also um, go the same with Michael. Um, I like the um, R community. And also one of the things I like with R, uh, it's easy for me to do some kind of data analysis with R. So now everything data analysis I use R, but anything concerning machine learning, I just go to Python. But I like R easier way for me to do analysis, statistical analysis and stuff like that. And I like the community. So um, I mean, combination of R and Python is really good for me. <laughs> yeah. And for all things Python, there is reticulate package. <laughs> That is true. But yeah, so I also tried to do Python. I really remember when I'm trying to move from um, R to Python. Uh, I think working with pandas is horrible. I find Deplier is so amazing in that regard. So amazing, it makes everything simple because indeed what you do most of the time in statistics or data analysis is uh, group by and summarize and then or counting. I mean, much it's, more straightforward, yeah. it's much more straightforward. And I, I just hate how pandas indexes the um, rows. I really hate it. And also I hate matplotlib, I have to say it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you have started with I'm sorry for I'm sorry for mat, matplotlib aficionados out there. I know that this will be uploaded into YouTube, so, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. And that's so, yeah. is just so, it's verbose, but it's so logical to me. Yeah, especially because the, most of the Tideverse tools, they were developed thinking uh, on the analyst point of view. So it's much more about doing data analysis than developing tools, actually. But they are now getting the effort to make the tools packageable, <laughs> to, to make it inside other tools. So it's getting better. <laughs> that is true. So yeah, oh, well, we're uh, 10 minutes um, over time. So I guess I don't want to um, hold you for longer. So really thank you for uh, participating in the first session. And I'm looking forward um, to meet you again in the following week. And yeah, so I saw that several people have access the um, the uh, Google Sheets. So it would be great if you can uh, fill your name and if um, if you have filled your name and then apparently well, life happens. I like nowadays. Yeah, I think everything unexpected can happen. Just uh, communicate in the Slack channel, and I think we can really um, find the best solution for all of us. If you have um, any um, other obligations. All right, so um, I will also post the um, the link in the in the Slack channel. So if you haven't joined the Slack channel, please do. Um, there will be a lot of information there, and the Zoom links can only be uh, generated a few minute, minutes before the session. So anyway, um, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. So see you next week. Bye bye. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.